Thank you for your very kind words. And first of all, my thanks also to Dr. Livio Oltano and his excellent team for their kindness in inviting me and getting us here today and looking after us. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to begin by just quoting a short poem uh, that I think illustrates the sort of unique dilemma society is in today. It's about a, um, a dachshund, a, a sausage dog, a long sausage dog, they call it. Um, it. It's a dachshund. There was a dachshund once who hadn't any notion how long it took to notify his tale of his emotion. So oft when his countenance was filled with woe and, sad, woe and sadness, his little tail went wagging on because of previous gladness. Now, there's a disconnect between a society today, the rapid advances in technology and communication that are propelling us towards a world of growing interdependence, and the tail, the mindset, the um, 19th mindset of politicians who can still think only in terms of their own trade and strategic, strategic interests and are not geared uh, are not geared to really come to terms with the necessities of the 21st century you know, in the 19th century, diplomacy and politics were all about um, looking to the strengths and weaknesses of foreigners. Um, and Europeans and later America and Russia would play the game of playing off one group of people against another for short-term gain and um, political influence. Flattery, hospitality, lavish gifts, clever exploited, exploitation of religious rivalry, and when necessary, brute force was used to control vast areas of the globe. Most European powers were involved in carving up Asia and um, Africa into spheres of influence, where petty dictators were installed not because of any um, adherence to human rights, not for any qualities like that, but for the quality of being able to subjugate the people under them. And then, when they were no longer required, they were just dispensed with. A few years ago, I was invited to a reception for two, by the British Prime Minister for um, a, an important guest of honour. The guest of honor was President Assad of Syria. You see how things change and um, politics just politicians still cannot help playing this sort of game and this the map of the world was divided and carved up in this reckless manner cutting across ethnic divides, religious divides and if a hundred years ago, for example, we had the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which carved up the Middle East into zones of influence for Syria, for, um, for France and Britain. And if anyone doubts the utter failure of old-fashioned diplomacy in the world of today, they only have to look at Syria today. I've focused on uh, the Middle East, but many other parts of the world were treated in the same way. Strategic interest, trade, that was all that was important. When the Sikh community, there's virtual genocide against the Sikh community in 1984, thousands of Sikhs were being killed. And I went to the then Home Secretary, um, the minister, to say, why are you so silent about what is happening to Sikhs in India? And he turned to me and said, Indigit, it's very, very difficult. We've already lost one major contract. Now, that is straight to my face. And more recently, on Tuesday of this week, in the House of Lords, questions were asked on the atrocities by ISIS uh, against Yazidi and Christian women. And uh, I commented, of course, that is a war crime, and it m that we must proceed in that way to bring the perpetrators to justice. But isn't the 
bombing of innocent civilians by the forces of Russia and the West for so-called strategic interest, almost also a war crime. The minister's response was amounted to something like, well, our bombs are more democratic. But I don't think the people of Syria saw it that way or see it that way. Friends, in today's smaller and interdependent world, 19th century pursuit of strategic interest that ignores fundamental human rights is, as we see around the world today, simply a recipe for disaster. Today, in the interest of all of us and those of succeeding generations, we need a new diplomacy that recognizes our individual well-being is inextricably linked to the well-being of all. If we do not make the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, and particularly Article 18 on religion and belief, uh, goal, we'll all be the losers. And those that come after us will look on the present generation of leaders with loathing and contempt. Politics has been pushing us towards populism, a negative populism that breeds and grows on prejudice against others. We need a new sort of populism that pulls us the other way to look to the greater good of all. There's a lot of work to be done there. Now let me say a few words about freedom of speech and freedom of belief. As a Sikh, I believe we should all be free to believe whatever we wish so long as it has no adverse effect on others. To put it lightheartedly, I don't mind anyone believing that the earth is flat, providing they don't try and push me off the end. <laughs> now, in the West, we quote Voltaire in support of this basic human rights. Voltaire said, I may not believe in what you say, but will defend to the death your right to say it. Friends, many years before Voltaire, the Sikh Guru Gur Tegh Bahadur, one of the founders of the Sikh faith, gave this noble sentiment practical utterance by speaking up for persecuted Hindus, those of another community who were being oppressed and forcibly converted by the Mughal and Muslim rulers of the time. He was beheaded for standing up for another community. We talk of tolerance, this sort of respect in Sikhism goes far further, the willingness to get, give your life for another's beliefs. But, my friends, the right of freedom of speech is not an absolute freedom. We do not have a right to cause fear and unnecessary hurt to others or deliberately give offense. But we do have both a right and a duty to point out to secular and religious authorities policies and interpretations of religious and political religious teachings and political policies that offend basic human rights. Constructive criticism of religion is fine, but it must be f based on fact rather than prejudice as it is today. Now, let me explain a little about the nature of prejudice. We like to believe it is the other people who have prejudice. We don't. We all have our prejudices. We all know that in a fog or mist, familiar objects can assume grotesque and frightening forms. And it's the same when we look at fellow human beings through a lens of ignorance and prejudice. It was the same sort of ignorance and prejudice that led to the first person being killed in uh, a reprisal attack in, in the United States after 9-11, the first person was a Sikh, simply because he wore a turban. That is the sort of ignorance. And later, a school, uh, a Sikh Gudwara was attacked, and many people killed with the same ignorant uh, uh, reasoning. Now, we do need to know basic religious literacy. But I'm afraid or almost of saying that because it's immediately taken up by professors and academics who will give long talks about religious literacy. We don't need that sort of li re religious literacy. Now, we don't really need to know what 
the holy days of different religions. That's not important. We do not need to know the shape and size of different religious buildings. Um, we, we don't need to know many basic things. Their holy days, days of worship, um, a number of um, uh, the size of their holy books and how they, the layout of buildings or anything like that. All we need to know for religious, the basic religious literacy that I'm speaking about is what does, what do those different religions around us say about the fundamental human rights that we aspire to today? What do the religions say about the equality of all humanity? Does, do they say anything? Um, gender equality and service to others, looking beyond ourselves to others, standing up for the rights and beliefs of others, tolerance and respect for human rights, the ways of life of others, concern for the future, and advice against misleading rituals and superstitions. Now, it is we do have a basic duty to talk about religion openly. It should not be treated as something too sacred to question. That religion that tells us how to live, move, and have our being should itself be open to question and challenge. Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh religion, who championed the right of belief of, of all people, was f also forceful in his criticism of practices that had become embedded in the religion. And we ought to understand that what passes for religion is often an amalgam of ethical teachings, uh, culture, uh, and um, uh, superstitious practices. Now, it's the ethical teachings that we need to focus on. And we've got a right to criticize any beliefs in religions that pushes, um, just focuses on cultural, dated culture, because culture does become dated. There was a time when the Islamic religion was ahead of its time in its treatment of women. But those teachings have become embedded in the culture and they do not live up to the aspirations of us today. But Guru Nanak could say things that I cannot say now on the BBC broadcast because we live in a very, very politically correct world. Must not give any offence to anyone. Now that makes it very difficult indeed. The, there's been a lot of talk in the, these seminars about respect for difference. Tolerance should be all about respect for difference. And I have picked up this book, Respect for Differences. Now, there is no mention whatever <coughs> of the Sikh religion, where the Sikh religion was foremost in respecting difference. The guru said that God isn't in the least bit bothered about our different religious labels. It's what we do for the betterment of humanity is all that's important. Guru Nanak took a Hindu and a Muslim for his traveling companions. The holy um, Amritsar, the uh, foundation stone of the Amritsar, was laid by a Muslim saint. Uh, Hindu and Muslim writings are included in our scriptures, the Guru Granth Sahib, to show that no one religion has a monopoly of truth. And yet, there is too much focus on the West assuming that the Abrahamic religions and Western society know it all. I urge everyone to look a little wider. We all have much to learn from us. Let me conclude. Religion can provide important ethical guidance to uplift society. But these religions, but religions that teach that they and only they have a special relationship with the one God of all, us, sorry, with the one God of us all, or that flout basic human rights in the treatment of women and other communities, need some basic and urgent reforming. Uh, it, it's an easy cop-out to say, oh no, we can't touch our um, holy book because that's the word of God. But if that holy book contains 
pretty vicious things against other communities, then we should realize it was written in the context of the difficulties the founders of those religions had at the time. Leaders, both religious and uh, political, should stop playing to the prejudices and culturally conditioned attitudes of their flock and lead us in addressing the needs and challenges of the world today. Religion and secular society must work together in building a better and more peaceful future. Thank you very much.